We can get ready to worship the Lord together. So we have, we'll start the day off, as always, with scripture. We can go to the next slide. So it's Psalm 135, chapter 6. And can we please say it together? For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. And our God is indeed a great God. And we were just, with our family, we were just reading the book of Job. And there's this part where Job, he is completely humbled. And, and everything is taken away from him, but yet... He still worships the Lord, and he blesses the name of the Lord, even though he has nothing. And that's kind of the humility we want to emulate and the kind of worship we want to do. And may we just keep that in mind as we praise our Lord together.
about time. So can we all just greet each other and welcome those who are new and just to...
of this city as well. There's no one like you. Yeah.
I have very good. Uh, I hope that you didn't have a, a traffic over uh, there. This across the road actually did leave across the road. Um, so, uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, so we have some visitors this morning. We would like to recognize your presence with us, uh, Min Yang. And, is that Andrea? Andrea. Andrea, oh, I'm sorry. Andrea and Michael. <laughs> Sam. Uh, yeah. And our sister Helen is with us this morning as well. Um, <clears throat> did I miss someone? Oh, we didn't get your name. Oh, Sam. Yeah, and Sam. Michael. And Michael at, at the back. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Evan, Evan, yes, yeah, wow, yeah. Well, that's always good whenever we have a long weekend and people are out and we have new visitors in that uh, to join us in our worship. Thank you, thank you. Um, we'll continue to pray for those who are away and they're coming back. The people are coming back at the same time this week and some are having a camping holiday. So today is the Lord's Day. Let's say it's Sunday, and we thank the Lord for giving us this youth and and how uh, we are blessed uh, uh, with well, with the parents and, and the church ministry. We'd like to, to thank the Lord for the way that He's been um, guiding us and uh, we continue to support them and, and uh, how we to grow in the Lord. Thank the Lord for them. So come to, it's good to be in a worshipful attitude, and I'd like you to all stand with me as we turn our Bible to Psalms 19. And I know that a lot of us are not feeling well, including Luz, who's not feeling well this morning, so he's just not with us. It's good to be reminded of the Word of God in Psalms 19. No, I think I'm leaving you from my ESV. <coughs> the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy, its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its deep. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honey comb. Wherever by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors, declare the innocent from heathen faults? Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. O Father, the heaven speaks clearly of your incomprehensible glory. I thank you, God, that we could be gathered today to declare that, to appreciate you and to love you and to declare. That's what it is. Eh? The sun moves under your direction. 
and your glory is on display throughout the earth, the universe, from one end of the heavens to the other. And God, we are in awe of you in your comprehensible power. And yet even more wonderful to us than your glory in creation is the revelation of yourself in the scripture, just like what we have read. Your law, your testimony, your precepts, your commandment, it is perfect. It is sure, it is simple, yet powerful. It is right. It is pure. It's clean. True. But it is. Costlier than gold. Even much fucking gold. And we therefore desire your word more than gold, finding it sweeter than honey. Oh, precious Heavenly Father, all our delight is in you and you alone. The deepest longing of our hearts is to see and to celebrate your glory. And our worship is all about you, not us. And that is why we give our love and worship to you in prayer. Oh God, we trust in your promises. We rejoice in your faithfulness. We glory in your goodness. And we hope in your word. We believe in your Son and rest in your grace. And we know that the past, the present, and even the future are all in your care. So we just trust in you, Lord. You're a faithful God. But this morning, Lord, we joyfully confess that your plan is best. Your commandment are just. Your wisdom is flawless. Your power is supreme. And all your ways are perfect. God, this morning we yield to you as our King, our Redeemer, and we ask that your will be done in us. We allow you to show your mercy and grace as you always do. And may we all leave in constant gratitude for all the things that you have done in our lives. You are a faithful God, even though we're not faithful at times. And now, Lord, as we come to worship, may you help us to recognize our mistakes. Quickly, mistakes that we repeat time and time again. We ask the Lord to fill our hearts with gladness, with holy, holy songs of praise, just like what we have sang. And restore us that we might be the kind of people that you want us to be. Because of your grace, we all come to worship you, Father. Relying on your forgiveness and power that we might enter in your presence. That we must be the true worshipers. Just in the name of our Savior. So again, Lord, receive us. With your cleansing power. Provided us the forgiveness that we need that we confess our sin, you said. You're faithful and just of forgiveness. So now, Lord, we come before you that our worship 
is unhindered, it is acceptable, it is right, it is proper. You receive all the praises and the glory. And to this we pray. In the name of Christ. We ask people to stand so. We ask that you lift the door to the class. I think there's a class. A, a huge Sunday. We we're thankful. And I ask if there's some who oh, give a testimony or just to share with us what the Lord is doing. But uh, maybe next time. I will be next Sunday. <clears throat> we have a, a special guest to speak to us. And, I like to prepare your hearts. Uh, we call him AJ used to be, and when they left the church, they were just simply like the little ones. <laughs> Whenever we have a Bible study, AJ was just playing in the other corner. I think he's, he used to be a, a computer a game guy. <laughs> and uh, now he's, he's Paul, and, and uh, AJ has been to, he went to Pacific Bible, or Pacific, yeah, I'm sorry. And I'm glad that uh, uh, God is directing your lives and what it's doing to see your growth in the Lord. Growing physically, but growth in the Lord. And I'm so thankful that uh, the Lord and I are with you. And why don't we welcome uh, AJ to share with us the word of God this morning. And we just got the... And we just got the mouth there. Um, just as Pastor Barlett mentioned, it wasn't. It's like a day. It was like, it's like a day like this. Uh, Twelve years ago, I think. I was a pretty bad kid. Like every time we had service, I would sneak away with my friend, and we would. Uh, if you remember Bookswood, there's a field uh, right beside it, and we would just hang out there for the whole service, and then we come back for the food. You know, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Those are different times, and since then, let me tell you, I, I, now I can't stay away from the church. Um, so, and I'm not talking about the building now, I'm talking about the people. Uh, our brothers and sisters that we want to hear. Though I may not recognize a lot of you, maybe even all of you, <laughs> most of you. And I don't, uh, I don't remember much from those days. I can still come back here and feel like a family. I've, I've tasted and seen. Uh, I've tasted and seen. And that's sort of what our goal is here today. We want to uh, taste and we want to see. You know. And um, one thing that I've learned, we're going to be talking, if you look at your bulletin, we're going to be talking about uh, idolatry. But the funny thing about it is that when I gave uh, Pastor Barlett my notes under idolatry in your bulletin, it has Jeremiah, Jeremiah 6 or so, and uh, Isaiah uh, 44, something like that. Um, I'm the kind of person who makes revisions all the way up until this morning. <laughs> and so uh, we're only looking at one of those uh, passages today. Uh, we'll be looking at more, but uh, Jeremiah, not so much. And um, what we're going to be talking about, as the bulletin says, is idolatry. And it's not idolatry in the sense where um, you, know, you have an idol, like a, an object, and then you bow to it and you worship it and you offer it. Where, what I want to talk about today is I want to take you guys deeper into the nature of idolatry. And the nature of it, um, to find that out, we're going to be going to the very beginning. But before then, um, I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to share with you guys a story. Uh, Lord, I just pray that our hearts are receptive here today. God, I thank you for uh, this week that you've blessed us with. Done and and uh, the continued blessings that you're going to be giving to us throughout our week. But Lord, let that not distract us um, from the true uh, food that we need, from the true uh, necessities of life. And that's your word. And that's your um, 
that's your presence here today. And so I call upon your presence. I call upon, um, I call upon you to open up our hearts, open up our ears and our minds. Maybe it's not the words that I say, but the words that you, that your people hear that they need. So bless us uh, as we go into your word. Amen. All right. So the story I'm gonna be talking about is uh, is about a man named John. Right. John, this is this is ancient times. So this is before technology was going on. And John went out with his friends to go hunting. Hunting with bows and arrows and, and spears and all that. See those uh, they, they leave at the dusk, uh, the dawn, sorry, the dawn of the day. They leave to go hunting into the forest. And as the day goes on, sort of John loses uh, his party. So he gets separated. John is going around, he's, um, he's looking left or right, trying to see if he could find something himself, or maybe if he could find his friends and join up with them. But further out, he notices there's a clearing in the trees. So he goes out there, and in front of him was this huge pond. Right? It's, it's a pond in the middle of the forest. And uh, it, it's, it's noon by this time, and the sun is up at its highest. He's getting really uh, parched. And he needs a glass of uh, he needs a drink of water. Sorry, and so he goes closer to the pond. As he approaches the pond, he he goes down on one knee. You know, he he scoops up a um, a good amount of water, and then he raises it up to his mouth. But as he was about to drink, uh, he notices something. There's another person there, and it, uh, it, they weren't very far, but uh, he noticed that this person noticed John, right? And, uh, and John, for, for John in particular, this person was the most beautiful person he had ever seen, right? Gorgeous. No one, no one in his life can compare in, in, in how this person appears, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And this person's noticing him. Their, their eyes are sort of locked together. Uh, he, he tries to move a little bit closer. He, he, gets, into, uh, he gets into the lake about uh, knee high. And this person's not, not going any further. Actually, this person's getting closer to him. Right? He, he starts leaning forward. He smiles. The person smiles. And, uh, and he, uh, he, tries, uh, he tries his luck and he leans forward for a kiss. He notices this person's leaning forward too. He goes to kiss this person and he finds himself drowning a little bit because the person that he saw was his reflection. The name, his real name, if you know any Greek mythology, his real name is Narcissus. The root word of Narcissus is, uh, well, it's narcissistic, right? It's being self-absorbed, it's being self-interested. And when we talk about idolatry, what we want to really look at is the nature of it. Because if you're treating the symptom, you'll never get rid of the disease. Right? Oftentimes, um, if, if someone stops worshipping uh, one thing, they just move on to the next. And then to the next. How do we stop this? How do we recognize it? Uh, what I learned over the years is, uh, is a better understanding of the word. Helps me, helps me fall in love with God a little bit better. And so what I want us to do, I want us to achieve today, is, is to understand the Word of God a little better. And therein, loving Him a little more. So if you could turn to uh, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verse 1 to 6. I'll read it out. It's, uh, it's in, my Bible's in the NIV. Get old and empty. And starting from verse 1, you guys can just catch up what I read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpents, You may eat fruit from the trees in this garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, 
and you and you will be like God, among good and evil. Now the funny thing about Narciss, uh, Narcissus is that he died in that pond. He he resolved. He decided for himself he would rather starve to death than leave, uh, than leave even a moment from his uh, reflection. And sort of that's what idolatry does to us. You know, that's what idolatry does to us. Now, what does this uh, passage have to do with idolatry? You know, we know the story of uh, um, Adam and Eve. They're enjoying the fruits of the garden. What's interesting, and we're going to do an aside here, what's interesting is that when you look at uh, verse 2, when you look at verse 2 and you, and you read chapter 8, uh, sorry, chapter 8, verse 2, it says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees growing out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden there was a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, as a child, as a kid growing up, even as a youth reading this, I was sort of like, I took it for granted, this passage. I never really thought, uh, I never really connected the dots together. And the dots that I'm trying to connect with you today, and this is the aside, is that if every, if God created Eden, the garden, and it says here in the Bible that every, every tree that he planted was, uh, was pleasing to the eye, right? And good to eat. Why was one tree forbidden? Why was one tree forbidden in that when he created an entire garden that his word, it says, it's good to eat. Why were they forbidden to eat it? What, what I can only uh, imagine is, and I think you can relate, when I was growing up as a kid, um, food was ready, a meal was ready, not when you can smell you know, something coming from the kitchen. Food wasn't ready when you could hear uh, pots and, and utensils clanging in the kitchen, right? The meal was ready when your mom or your dad said, Kat in now, or it's time to eat. And for God and Adam and Eve, this tree of knowledge of good and evil is good to eat, but not at the time that they desired it. God said, not yet. God said, not yet. And yet, the serpent was able to influence Eve, influence Adam into taking this fruit. And I wonder why. Um, I was, uh, uh, one of the jobs that I took uh, since I graduated was, uh, was sales, you know. I did door-to-door -door sales. I don't know if you've seen this on your door. Uh, people selling uh, Telus home services, all right? And then they, well, what they do is try to, it's a sales technique uh, of exclusivity, where it's like, you can only get this now, or you can only get this with us. And that's sort of their, their bait, right? Now, what did, what did Satan do to bait Eve? Right? What did he say? He said, did God truly say this or that? He did, yes. Then he lies, you will surely not die. But I don't think that's the bait. I think the bait comes after that. The bait comes when he says this, and, and let's read it here. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to uh, the woman. That's the lie. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Was it knowledge? I don't think so. I mean, Eve was in right standing with God who knew everything. If you ever had a question, you could just ask him, Lord, Father, Abba, Father, what, what is this, what is that? God wouldn't hide it from her. But what was the bait? Your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. And I think here, in, in the entirety of God's Word, here is the first example of idolatry. <laughs> The nature of idolatry is not that you um, worship another being. It's that you worship yourself. It's self-worship. Uh, if we turn to 
Isaiah 44, and we start at verse 8. It's, it's going to be a long one, guys, so we're going to be fun. Isaiah 44, verse 8. Uh, the Lord uh, is speaking through Isaiah. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? There is no rock, no other rock. I know not one. This is God talking to his people. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they, they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Who shapes a god and casts an idol, which can profit nothing? People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen are only human beings. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and shame. And, and here comes a discourse where he, uh, God is talking about how man creates a God in his own image. It might not be in his own likeness, but he creates uh, a boar. You know, if you look at the Egyptian pantheon, you have, you have a body of a man and the head of, an, uh, of a hawk, right? Or the head of an alligator or a crocodile. You have, you have um, people crafting their own gods who don't really exist, but they're crafting it in their own image. And in, in counseling terms, right, we call that projecting. Because what you're doing is that you're giving attributes, you're, sorry, you're attri uh, attributing values and qualities onto something else. Right? Now, uh, this image of Horus, this image of Zeus, this image of whatever name you call it, Baal, you, you give it power because it's the one, you're, you're really just, it's a reflection of what you value, right? People, people worship an idol, but really it's a reflection of themselves. There's, um, I really like Greek mythology, and so uh, I, I read it from time to time. But one thing that, uh, that ruined my perspective is, uh, if you've ever seen the, the Disney movie, Hercules, right? I don't know if you've seen that. It's a little old. But in it, Hercules is, is depicted as this, you know, he's this honest, naive uh, guy who just wants to please his dad, who just wants to, wants to save the day. And then you see Zeus as this guy who just really misses his son. He really wants to be with his son. He's a jolly guy. He's a happy guy. And he just wants what's best for the world. But once you read the actual mythology of, uh, of the Greeks, you notice something. They're a, the complete opposite. Zeus is, a, is the kind of guy who sleeps around and cheats on his wife. Actually, Hercules is an illegitimate child of Zeus. And Hercules is, is this selfish, uh, he's like what you would imagine Samson to be like, just extend his story a bit more, right? Very selfish, very, very self-centered. All he wants to do is uh, receive glory for himself. And why, why is it different? Because it's the cultures that change the value of these images. If, if you look at Greek, uh, Greek culture, the kind of gods that they had reflected the kind of culture that they had. You would have womanizing men. You'd have men who, who seek only for their own glory. Now you watch the Disney version of that, and it's still a reflection of our culture, right? We want to be honest. We want to be innocent. We want to be happy all the time. They, they say that uh, entertainment and, uh, and media runs downstream from our culture, which means it's a reflection. It just comes from it. And that's what we see here, that, you know, it... it Isaiah 44, it reads, A blacksmith make, takes a tool, he works with it in his coals, he shapes an idol with hammers, and he forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and he grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line, and it's all these people creating things, and yet with the spare parts they create an idol and they worship it. And God's here saying, I made you out of my own image. Why are you worshiping something that you made in your image? Mm -hmm. right? 
the fate of narcissists is the fate of anyone who uh, decides to worship anyone other than God. It's starvation. When we, when we look at idolatry in this way, when we look at how uh, ancient Greeks, how Israel even, you know, Baal, if you read the book of Kings, uh, Baal is, is the one that really captivates uh, the Israelites quite a bit. Why? Because um, with God, you have to sacrifice your livestock. You have to sacrifice your, uh, your grains. That's your money. That's your, that's your life savings. You have to offer those things for your sins. But with Baal, what's, what's, the, what's the exchange? Go to the temple. Uh, have sex with the prostitute at the temple. You know? Where is the sacrifice in that? Of course people are going to worship that kind of God. Of course people are going to follow that kind of God because that God agrees with them. You know, if you... Uh, 2016 was a big year for uh, politics in the States. And... Um, I didn't follow it too much in terms of uh, the speeches and all that. But what I've noticed with politicians is that they really like to refer to God. Right? In God, in, in God we trust. However, they never mention which God. It's very, it's very convenient to have a God that agrees with you. Very convenient to have a God that doesn't really have a voice. That doesn't really have a will of its own. It's a reflection of the culture. It's idolatry. You can say it's a god, but really you're just worshipping yourself. And in understanding idolatry, we can further understand sin. Because uh, what I've found, and, and you can disagree with me on this, but um, what I've found when I look into this is that most sins, most sins are an, exp uh, are an expression or can be defined as an expression of self-worship. And what do I mean by that? When we lie, who do we lie for? Right? Even if it's a white lie, you know, like I, I don't want to tell her the truth because uh, it'll hurt her feelings or it'll complicate things. When you lie, who do you lie for? Is it for yourself? When you steal, who do you steal for? When you murder, who do you murder for? And even omission, when you omit good from others, or even from yourself, the Bible teaches us that omission is a sin, and I've been learning how hard that is. Um, on Mondays and just sprinkled throughout the week, I, I volunteer for a youth organization called Young Life. And in Young Life, uh, it's a volunteer position, and yet they ask for at maximum 16 hours of your week. And what, what it's for is for you to go to the schools, to talk to the kids, to hang out with the kids, and just share your testimony. It doesn't have to be really an, uh, evangelical. We try to, we use the words uh, Christianese to describe, uh, you know, like really Christian words that uh, no, uh, other people wouldn't understand. And so just for uh, at least once a week, just go into the schools or call a kid and hang out with them. And uh, just this last year, I realized how easy it is to omit good for others. It's a sin. And yet, when we do that, who are we doing it for? It's for ourselves. I want my time. I want to rest. I want to do this. I want to do that. But in doing those things, in denying the good and the conviction in my heart, the Holy Spirit puts in me, I am denying good from others. When we're lazy, when we're angry, and we act on that anger, most sins can be defined as an expression of self-worship, of self-idolatry. Um, I was a youth leader at another church uh, a few years ago, and one of the youth came up to me one time, and he shared with me uh, his struggles. He was sleeping with his girlfriend, um, and he was in high school. And it wasn't just once or twice, it was, it was just happening all the time. 
and he and he knew Jesus all his life, right? He was raised in a Christian home, and uh, he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he was struggling with it, and he asked me for help. Which, another aside, you guys, that is exactly what you do when you are struggling with sin. Ask your brothers and sisters for help. Ask your church members. Ask your pastor, your leaders for help. But uh, this this friend of mine came up to me. He asked me for uh, for advice, and on the drive home one time, he 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 said this to me. Right? He says, um, "Let me find it here." He says, "I don't know how to stop it, AJ. I can't help myself. I just love her so much." Right? And like, as an older person listening to a high schooler say that, it's sort of like, uh, like, do you really? But this is how I responded to him. I said, love is, ser- is about serving the other. But whenever you're having sex, or letting things lead into bad situations outside of marriage, you're only serving yourself. You're only loving yourself. And... That's not an exclusive thing to my friend. I've I've noticed, uh, even in churches, that guys and girls, they struggle with this. They struggle with um, with, uh, just, they believe that they're helping others, but they're doing it for themselves. They believe that they're, that they're, and and this is a, this is a new problem for guys, I think, because uh, what I found in, in guy relation, in relationships between a guy and a girl, um, it used to be that the guy is the one pressuring the girl into things, right? But since since the last uh, two decades or so, because of the sexual revolution that happened in, in the West, now it's now it's on both players' fields. Now you have girls also asking uh, for these for these things, and now it's now the the pressure is on the guy to n- never want to disappoint the one that he cares about, never want to. Um, never want to uh, to let them down, and so you know the pressure is on both. But it, at the end of the day, whether you think you're doing it for someone else or not, it's really just for yourself. I went through a, uh, a similar time in my life, right? And I was totally infatuated with a girl. Totally gross. God delivered me from making irreversible mistakes, however, at the end, I did learn something. I learned the meaning of life for sure. I don't know if you've experienced this as a teenager, but when you first fall in love as a teenager, uh, or should we say fall infatuated, I don't know. You know. When that first happens to you, all you can think about, from the forefront to the very back of your mind, is how do I make this person happy? What can I do? And every time you do something, it doesn't seem very hard to do it because you're happy to do it. I learned life worship from a very bad time, a very bad place. And that's sort of what I want to lead into. Because what I've found when you're reading the Bible, and it's not like a hidden message, okay? When you're reading the Bible, you find that God's will for your life is very contrary from what your body desires, right? I'm talking about the times in young life where I I need to make a drive to Guilford and hang out with kids for maybe 30 minutes or an hour in a day. You know, I'm talking about um, seeing a person on a sky train and they're crying and I'm just on the other side but I don't want to bother them. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to maybe intrude on their day, right? And then you tell, and God is telling you clearly in your heart, why don't you talk to this person? Why don't you uh, comfort this person? No one cries on the sky train under normal circumstances, right? God's will for your life is very different from what our bodies desire. And because of the fall, that's not a, that's not, um, a secret. 
but this is what uh, it, it's funny because we read uh, Pastor Brother for us. He read uh, Psalm 119. Thank you. I'll explain this later. Um, what Pastor Violet read for us uh, earlier was uh, Psalm 119, and I love uh, that entire chapter because it talks about suffering, but it also talks about God's law. Suffering comes from living in this, this darkened world, this fallen world. But when he talks about God's law, the writer is saying, oh, how I delight in it. Oh, how it's a light unto my path. Man, how can a, how can a young person uh, stay in purity? By living according to your word. You know, it, it, it's different. I, I work with youth uh, since I graduated. And before I graduated, I was a youth. So uh, I know everyone's complaint as a kid is that, you know, it seems like being Christian is just a, is just a full set of laws. It's just you can't live your life as a Christian. You can't have as much fun as everybody else. But it's completely different. Here he says, your law is a delight. It's pleasing to my heart. It lifts burdens from me. Your word and your law doesn't confine me. It frees me. In Philippians 4.8, uh, Peter is writing and he says uh, something that I, I say over to myself all the time because it's such a good word of encouragement. And it, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, and whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's not, God is not saying that once you're saved, it's going to be smooth sailing from here. God's not saying that once you're saved, um, you know, when, when, when it says that he'll make your path straight, sometimes we'd rather just go around, right? Have you ever gone on a straight path on top of a mountain? That's the hardest way to go, right? Sometimes God's will for us in our lives is not our will for ourselves. And so it's this constant battle. That's why it's between us or Him, who are we going to worship? Us or Him, His will or I, our will? Who are we going to follow? And while I'm saying this, it might sound like, um, it might exhaust you. I know it did when I first um, thought about it. You know, like, I'm always going to be struggling with this. Am I always going to be um, fighting against myself? But then you read, I believe it's... Uh, I think it's 2 Peter. Yeah. We read 2 Peter, verse 3, and Peter confidently says his, his um, divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us great and precious promises that through him we may participate in the divine nature having escaped from corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Now, I don't believe for one moment you're going to be perfect on this side of the pretty gates. I don't believe that. But I do believe that God has equipped you. The youth, uh, last Friday, they talked about uh, how uh, no temptation that has come over you is common, uh, is not common to man. But you're facing the same thing we all face. But God is faithful to uh, never let you go through things that you're not capable of overcoming, and He will always provide for you a way of escape. And so when you're going through these uh, times in your life, maybe you're not thinking about it, um, where you really, you really find that you're serving yourself a lot. You really find that all you can think about is maybe your career, maybe, um, maybe your grades. Maybe it's a good thing. Grades and career is a good thing. Maybe you're thinking so much about your kids or your, or your spouse you know, or your parents. But you think of them as uh, too high of a thing. Uh, I've told my cousin many times is that uh, 
real stress, unhealthy stress comes from your life when you make something uh, ultimate. You know, when you when you give something um, when you give something that's just a part of life to be your source of life, where God is supposed to be your source of life, where uh, your you can give him your stress and you can just let him lead you and guide you. When you let other things, and this is what this is what um, idolatry looks like nowadays. When you're giving other things this position that God has, it is just going to ruin you. I'm very eloquent way of saying it, but it's true. And so the nature. I'm just going to recap here the nature of idolatry and the understanding of sin. Once you understand that everything is just you or God, and I'm not saying this in the sense where you're wicked and you're evil and, and all that stuff, your fallenness, that part of you that is just you want to uh, do your own thing that is apart from God, you know, Understanding that and really realizing that and focusing, keeping your mind on things that are, are good, things that are true. And understanding and believing in God's promises that He is faithful to you and that He's given you and equipped you with everything that you need in the present time. Hopefully it will help you understand and help you fall deeper in love with His Word and what He as in, uh, what desires he has for you in his life. So I'll pray. And when I'm finished praying, let's pass it uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for everyone here today. Um, I want to thank you for um, giving us this time in our week to just focus on you, to set our minds and fix our eyes on you and your word today. And Lord, whatever your people have received, whether it's the very words from your uh, from my mouth that they that have touched them, or the stray thoughts even that they've had while I was talking, may it be your food for them today. May it edify them. May it build them up. And God, I just want to extend a prayer of blessing over uh, your people here. May you continue to guide them. May you continue to challenge them and equip them with the tools necessary to overcome. In your mighty name, amen.
was being led by our sister Christelle. But in our uh, children ministry, and I was coming BBS. I like all of you to volunteer and to take part in this actively. And, uh, now you have to see Neil and Lucy and that, and I live as well. I'm actually prepared for the BBS. So are you who are first time comer up, we encourage you to stay behind and have some snack and, and a thank you for the worship and the Would you start with me now as we close the prayer? Father, we thank you for your presence in our midst as we celebrate your day. Thank you, God, for the message to our hearts, for a reminder that often we're victims and we often even look at ourselves and become God. <laughs> and there's many other ways. Lord. We thank you, God, that in this day forward that you will continue to guide us. Thank you, God, for our friends who have came. May you bless them and may we see them again. And thank you, God, even for <clears throat> short fellowship that we'll be having. Thank you for that. Hands that have prepared our spot. Now, grant your traveling mercy to those who are traveling this week. And Father, give them a good time. And, and even Lord, us who will be staying behind you. What a beautiful weather outside you've given us. May you just give us time for the family and friends. Give us your blessing from here on till we meet again. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.